Yeah, thank you very much. So, hey, uh, hello everyone. Uh, as he said, I'm Marcel Back uh, Pages. I'm in between actually the lab, uh, Preston Lab, Bill Preston Lab in the Department of Plant Sciences and Castello Lab in the Department of Biochemistry uh, at the Univ University of Oxford. Um, so, I want to talk today about RNA binding proteins and plant immunity, but I would like to start um, by talking about RNA binding proteins. So, what, what do they do? Uh, what, what are they, right? So, RNA binding proteins. They regulate RNA metabolism and localization. And so, since the RNA is transcribed until it's eventually translated or degraded, in each of the steps of its life, life cycle, the RNA is bound by RNA binding proteins, and that's what it determines the fate of RNA. So, basically, by regulating RNA metabolism and localization, RNA binding proteins are key at uh, post transcriptional regulation of gene expression. So, also, in a very simplified manner, plants can perceive pathogens, uh, can perceive mo moieties of pathogens using uh, path um, pattern recognition receptors or PRR here. And this, this um, triggers a signaling cascade that eventually leads to transcription of defense related genes. And then these transcripts are eventually exported to the cytoplasm where they will be translated into proteins to mount a defense response. So basically, the sensing of the pathogens leads to a reprogramming uh, of the plant transcriptome to mount a defense response. Now, we know that rna binding proteins are very important uh, to orchestrate this transcriptional reprogramming of the plant immunity. And basically, what they do is uh, what we call the RBP, or rna binding protein mediated um, defense and response. That's how, how we call it. We also know that some pathogens, such as pseudomasringi, can deliver some effectors uh, into the plant cell, and this can interfere with host processes. And so some examples are the targeting of rna binding proteins to disrupt plant immunity. And so by targeting rna binding proteins, um, these effectors can disrupt the RBP-mediated um, defense response. And so this actually highlights the importance of, the, of rna binding proteins, that they are being targeted um, or exploited by pathogens to disrupt plant immunity. And a beautiful example of that was a paper in, published in Nature in 2007 by Alfano Lab, in which the uh, effector of pseudomasuringi called HOP U1 can actually target an RNA binding protein of Arabia cristalliana called GRP7, and by doing so, it disrupts, it cancels plant immunity. So, as I said, we know that RNA binding proteins are important for plant immunity, that some of them can be targeted by pathogen effectors, and even that they are important for the pathogens themselves, for pathogenicity themselves. But all these studies have been like individual papers where they describe one or a small bunch of proteins that are rna binding proteins that are involved in plant immunity. But we need, we're lacking global, global approaches. So our main objective here is to understand how rna binding proteins contribute to plant immunity. And to do so, we have like subdivided this into smaller goals um, to be able to, to achieve to understand how RBPs or RNA binding proteins work in plant immunity. So the first one was to be able to develop a technique that allows us to globally or comprehensively study RNA binding proteins. And then from that, we're going to study how RBPs are regulated during plant immunity, and then if actually these regulating these regulations are actually important or relevant for plant immunity. So let's start by um, developing the technique. So actually a few months ago, um, we published this paper in Biomolecules where we actually um, optimize this technique called RNA interaction capture to plants. Uh, we developed this new protocol and we were very original because we call it plant RNA interaction capture or PTRIC uh, for short. And what this allows you is to comprehensively identify the active RNA binding proteins in vivo. So basically to identify, by active I mean the ones that are actively bound to the RNA, so the RBPs that are actively bound to the RNA at a certain moment. So how it works is you apply UV light um, to plants, to living cells, and what this promotes is uh, cross-linking a covalent bond between the proteins and the RNAs that are bound to them. So UV light creates short-lived radicals um, within the nucleotide bases of RNA 
and they will attack anything that is in the proximity. So basically only the proteins that are bound to it and this creates a covalent bond between the RNAs and the proteins. So then what we do is we pull down the polyadenated RNAs using oligo bits. So the T's will um, hybridize with the poly-A tails of the RNAs and then we can pull down. And it's important to say that here we use very stringent conditions. So just primary proteins, so bind, um, proteins binding directly to the RNA will pull, pull down and all these secondary proteins binding through protein-protein interactions, they will be removed. So when we have this, we can degrade the RNA and we can actually add in, um, analyze the protein fraction using either Western blot, silver staining or mass spec analysis. So that's what you get basically. Here on the left hand side, uh, we have the inputs, the total proteins. So this is all the proteins of a, of a cell. Uh, whereas on the right hand side, we have the LH. So these are the proteins that co purify with the RNA. That when we pull down the RNA, they are co pulled down uh, with them. So when we apply UV light, we see a complex pattern with a lot of proteins. And those are the ones that are bound to the RNA. Whereas when we don't apply UV light, then we see that basically we are pulling down clean pure RNA. And so then we can actually identify and quantify these uh, RNA binding proteins uh, using mass spectrometry techniques. So this is a volcanic plot in which on the x axis we have the full change of the cross link sample versus the non cross link, and on the y axis we have the p value. And so basically um, we can see enrichment of proteins in the crossing samples, and these are the RNA binding proteins. So basically, we can use PTRIC, uh, plant RNA interton capture, to comprehensively identify the RNA binding proteins that are bound to the RNA at a certain moment. And we have to say that it's important to say that we have optimized this for plant leaves, which we think is a relevant issue, especially to study plant immunity. Um, by doing that, we have identified the most extensive uh, are in plant leaves, and this includes RBPs from many different compartments, including chloroplast and mitochondria, that were previously uh, underrepresented in the, in the RBPOMs. And then about 75% of these protein RNA binding proteins that were identified, they were annotated already. They were known to be involved in RNA biology. They had links to RNA biology uh, somehow. But about 25% uh, of the RNA binding proteins we found, they had no previous links to RNA biology. So they were not known actually to bind RNA. And so they represent novel uh, non-canonical uh, RNA binding proteins. And something that I think is very cool is that we found a lot of proteins from the photosynthetic apparatus binding RNA. And so not only from the photosynth uh, photosystem 2 or photos photosystem 1, but also from the cytochrome B6F, and the FITPAs. So from the four major um, protein complexes within the photosynthetic apparatus, they have a lot of proteins within those uh, complexes that actually bind the RNA. And uh, we also found a lot of uh, more lighting RNA binding proteins. So these are proteins or enzymes that they are doing a normal job, let's say in glucose metabolism, and then at some point they moonlight. So they have another job, they moonlight as uh, RNA binding proteins. And this is something that is very cool because it's seen in other organisms like yeast or humans, and we're just starting now to, to realize about this in plants. And then we also found a lot of RNA binding proteins that did not have any domain, any known domain to bind RNA, but they had other domains. So by comparing these RNA binding proteins with not known RNA binding domains, we're starting to realize that maybe some of these ones that are in common in these proteins may be ways by which these proteins actually bind RNA. So there's scope for identifying novel uh, RNA binding domains in plants. And so not only we managed to um, apply this to Arabius Italiana, as I show you all the results that I show you, but we have applied this to a different range of um, plant species. So a species from the plant kingdom from Mercantia, from moss to all the way through uh, to monocots and, and dicots. And we have actually sent um, some of these species to mass spectrometry so we can kind of reconstruct the history of the RNA binding proteomes across the, the plant kingdom. So now we have the, um, the technique, the methodology. 
So we would like to now apply to actually understand um, how RVPs are regulated during planting aid. So just as a reminder, um, RNA binding proteins are important or are key in orchestrating this transcriptional reprogramming that happens during plant immunity to, plant immunity to actually lead to the defense response. And we want to know actually which RNA binding proteins are actually involved in this reprogramming and what do they do. So that's um, basically a paper that we have deposited in BioArchive about a couple of weeks ago. So if you are interested, please go and, and read it. And if you have any comments, any input, I'm always open to, to chat about that and to collaborate. So for that paper, what we used was Arabidopsis as a model plant and then FLAC22 as the immune elicitor. So FLAC22 is a 22 amino acid peptide that is derived from the flagella of the bacteria. And when plants sense it, uh, it triggers an immune, an immune response. So we, uh, we treat the plants with a mock, so water, or with FLAC22. And then at two different time points, uh, two hours and 12 hours, we harvested tissue and we cross-linked it. And we used two hours and 12 hours so we could capture kind of the early responses and the late responses of the, of the RBPO. Next, what we did was to use our technique, Petri or plant RNA interton capture, to pull down the active rna binding proteins and send off to mass spec. So this is going to tell us about changes in activity of the rna binding proteins upon plant tp treatment. But also we sent the inputs, so the total proteomes, to be able to capture also the changes in protein abundance. So here we're getting two levels, changes in activity and changes in abundance of the rna binding proteins. And so that's what you get, basically. So this is a volcano plot um, in which on the uh, x-axis, sorry, we have the FLAC22 versus MOC, full change, whereas on the um, y-axis we have the p-value. Anything that is in red or in warm colors, it's going to be um, up in FLAC22, stimulated in FLAC22, whereas anything which is in cold colors is going to be down in FLAC22 or like um, enriched in, uh, in MOC. And we did that for the early time point and for the late time point. And we actually found a lot of RNA binding proteins whose activity is altered um, upon immune activation. So many RNA binding proteins that they alter the activity upon immune activation. So then we started looking into, into what these proteins were and we found the usual suspects. So um, proteins that RNA binding proteins that were actually known to be involved in the plant immunity. And so that actually reinforces that what we're getting actually makes sense, right? And so one of them is uh, PAT1, so uh, it's involved in decapping and p-body formation, and it's previously, previously been described to be involved in immunity against um, the monosuringi. And so then we also found the RNA helicase 6, that it was recently described as well to be involved in, in immunity. So as I said, that was reassuring that our data set actually makes, uh, makes sense. And so then we evaluated uh, those by doing PTRIC followed by Western blood. And so the proteins, some of the proteins that we selected that were stimulated, then we were seeing them in the Western blood more, uh, more bound to the RNA, whereas the opposite was true for proteins that were inhibited upon factor two. And then we were wondering, okay, so we have all these proteins that change in activity, but why are they changing in activity? Are they just changing in activity? or are they changing in activity because of changes in abundance? So like, in other words, we found more protein bound to RNA just simply because there's more protein, right? So what we did is we sent the inputs, um, the total proteins, to mass spectrometry, and we analyzed the changes in abundance, and then we correlated both data sets, the ones that were changing in activity and the information about the changes in abundance. And that's what we had. So, um, Basically here on the x-axis, we have the full change of mock uh, FLAC22 versus mock in the inputs. So this is gonna tell us about the changes in abundance here. Um, whereas on the y-axis, we have the full change FLAC22 versus mock in the L weights. So this is gonna tell us changes in activity. So now what we see for the early time points is that most of the proteins are in blue here, meaning that they're changing in uh, activity but without changes in uh, abundance. And just few of them are in red here, meaning that they change both in activity and in abundance. So it looks like 
early on this like some mechanism that either stimulate them or inhibit them to bind more or less RNA. And when we check at the late later time point, we see actually that the changes in a, in activity due to changes in abundance um, are starting to be more prominent. So there are more red dots on the diagonal and less blue dots in the center. So it looks like at late time points, the abundance driven changes in activity start to be more, more predominant. So now, especially at early time points, we have the proteins are changing in activity, but not changing in abundance. And we know that some the activity of some RBPs, RNA binding proteins, is actually regulated by post-translational modifications or PDMs. So we're like, okay, let's check if that's our case as well. So we basically download annotations of uh, PTMs for all the protein of the biopsies, and we compare those RNA binding proteins changing activity over the total uh, amount of the total um, RNA binding proteins we identify in the data set. And so what we find is that at early time points, we have certain, um, so for certain PTMs, for translation modifications, um, we have enriched uh, sites in our uh, proteins that change upon factor 22. So it, it, this hints that these proteins may be um, regulated by these, uh, by these PTMs. And uh, especially interesting, the uh, s nitrosylation So s nitrosylation is the addition of nitric oxide molecules to the sulfidryl groups of cysteine. And we know that uh, nitric oxide, or NO, is produced heavily during plant immunity. And we know also that it, it plays important roles in transcriptional regulation um, um, during immune responses. And we are seeing here that um, it's possibly the s nitrosylation is also playing a role in post-transcriptional regulation of gene expression by actually modulating the uh, interaction between RNAs and proteins, which I think it's a, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, whereas in late time points, we see that there is no enrichment of uh, PTMs of this protein that change in activity over the total. So uh, we conclude that here, um, PTMs are not like a driving force for the remodeling of the RBPM. So our current model is that at early time points, the RBPs are already there and then they are somehow modified, possibly by PTMs, to be activated or repressed, so to bind more or to bind less RNA. Whereas at late time points, there is more time for genes to be transcribed, then to be translated, and then for these proteins to bind RNA. So it looks like the abundance-driven changes start to be more, more predominant, and PTMs are not such a driving force. So now we wanted to actually start looking more into these proteins with more or less association with uh, with RNA. And we found actually some some common trends, some common dynamics, and so we see that, for instance, some proteins there, like here in uh, in orange, are stimulated at late time points. Some are stimulated throughout the response. Um, sorry, some others are stimulated early, and then they get to a plateau, or some are like more dynamic. They go up in the beginning and then they, they go down. And the same is true for the ones that are inhibited, the same kind of similar similar trends. So then we went to check what uh, dig a bit deeper into, into those. So uh, what we found is that the ones that are inhibited during plant immunity, they are mostly RBPs known to be involved in RNA metabolism, right? And so we think that here um, the plants are on such a critical condition that it's like, oh, I'm being attacked by a pathogen. What it does is like it shuts off or it represses a bit the normal RNA metabolism to kind of favor the this kind of uh, stress response uh, or critical response upon um, pathogen attack. And so some protein groups or some RBP groups that are regulated are, for instance, um, editing. So this involves CTU or like a serum synthesis. And um, one example here is, for instance, we have found inhibition of the ORRM1 protein, and that controls about 62% of the C2U uh, editing sites in the chloroplast. So quite remarkable changes, actually. And we have also seen a uh, massive downregulation of um, the inductivity of proteins involved in synthesis. So initiation factors, elongation factors, ribosomal proteins, and then also 
something that was surprising there is like nascent peptide uh, modification enzymes. Um, then for the ones that are stimulated, um, we found that they're not that much involved in or known to be involved in normal RNA metabolism, but they are stress related proteins and a lot of mole lighting enzymes. So for instance, we have found a number of proteins involved in P bodies. So P bodies are membrane-less compartments where RNAs are either degraded or um, stored. I mean, they're actually known to be involved in immunity. So that was an also another reassuring thing of, of our data set. And then we found, as I said, a lot of mole lighting enzymes. So these are, for instance, the HITCHA proteins or the PPases, which are um, molecular chaperones, and they've been described in other organisms to bind RNA. So we not only show here that they bind RNA, but they sh we show that they have a response upon uh, immune activation. And we also found some uh, metabolic enzymes as well, not only binding RNA, but potentially binding uh, RNA. And so here in this case, it looks like some enzymes are doing their normal job during normal growth um, phase. I know, for instance, in glucose metabolism, and then upon flattening to or upon immune activation, the plants say like, okay, a pool of you guy, a part of you, just leave your job in metabolism and go and bind RNA and do a functioning RNA, which uh, we still don't know exactly what, what it is. And so then we found a group of um, families that had some members that were up-regulated and some members that were down-regulated. Um, so for instance, there was RNA helicases, which um, they are very important for um, unwinding of the RNA secondary structure, and they're involved in like any process. And so it's not surprising that they are also involved in implant immunity. Um, we found a, a number of splicing factors, and we know that splicing and alternative splicing, it's very important for the adaptive responses of plants to environmental challenges. So it actually makes sense that uh, they are also involved here in immunity. And then something that I think is also very cool is that we not only found, uh, as I said in the beginning, that photosynthesis-related proteins bind RNA, but we found that they differentially bind RNA upon flanking treatment. And not only that, but that within the photosystem, it depends on where they are, that they are regulated, up-regulated or down-regulated. So proteins in the photosystem one and two are down-regulated, whereas in the oxygen-evolving complex, they are up-regulated, um, let's see. So it seems that to be a trend depending on where they are in the, in the photosystem. So now that we have found all these RBPs that change, um, changing if these proteins were involved in immunity, if we altered their um, abundance, so if we knock them out, or if we overexpress them and then challenge them with a pathogen, we should see a phenotype. So out of the 330 RBPs that we identified, um, we selected 21 mutants, and we challenged them with uh, Pseudomonas ringi, Pathobar tomato, DC3000, and that elicits disease in Neriopsis. And also we used its Newton harp a which cannot deliver effectors, and it uh, induces PTI, or immune response, um, called PTI, pan triggered immunity. And we actually found that 11 of them show altered uh, disease resistance. So today I'm going to talk just about two examples. So the first one is the RNA helicase 11. So we obtained a couple of mutants, uh, tDNA insertion mutants um, for the RNA helicase 11. We challenged them with the pathogens and we saw that the mutants are more resistant to Pseudomonas ringi pathogen tomato. So here in black you have the call zeros, whereas in red you have the mutants. And as you can see, there's less growth in the mutants as compared to, to the call zeros. And this may be related to actually an increased rose burst of the mutant. Another example I want to talk about today is the IN2. So we got a mutant of IN2 called IN21 that was described in a science paper a long time ago. And we challenged it with a Sidomosuringi with both um, uh, strains. And we see that it, uh, it's susceptible to both strains, so that there's more bacterial growth upon infection. Whereas if you actually overexpress IN2 in the mutant background, then you get restored level of resistance. And this actually correlates very well with the amount of ROS. So as you see here, 
Col zero. If you mutate uh, IN2, then you get a reduced ROS burst in purple. Whereas if you overexpress in the medium background, so you complement it, then you get normal levels of ROS and normal levels of um, resistance. So I want to talk a bit more about IN2 because I think it's uh, it's very cool. And so basically, IN2 has a transmembrane domain in the uh, ER and a cytoplasmic domain. So upon ethylene perception and also ethylene is produced. And during immunity, so upon immunity activation, um, a bit of this, this cytoplasmic domain called the CN is cleaved, and it can do two, two things. So one is the cleave, one is the cleave and shuttle model, where it can shuttle the nucleus, where it basically represses a repressor of transcription factors. So basically, it stabilizes some transcription factors that then they can give the ethylene response. But it can also remain cytoplasmic, and that, that was something pretty new from 2015, and that was uh, quite shocking, that they discovered it can also remain cytoplasmic. And it can bind the three prime UTR of these repressors, and it can target them to be bodies to be stored and degraded. So we wanted to dig a bit deeper into the function of I2 and into our data. So we started by mapping the peptides of I2 in the I2 sequence. And then on the y-axis, we have the mean peptide intensity. So what we see here is that upon FLAC22 treatment, we see more peptides and with higher intensity than in the mock treatment. So there's a rapid stimulation of, uh, of IN2. And so also when we check the dynamics, we see that it's a dynamic response because at 12 hours, at late time points, they go back to normal levels. So they are increased at early response and then they go back to, to normal levels. And so here we were expecting um, peptides, to find peptides just in the CN, right? The, the bit that is known to be cleft and to bind RNA. But to our surprise, we found peptides outside this bit. So we have peptides that span all the cytoplasmic domain, suggesting that there is a, a longer isoform of IN2 that comprises all the cytoplasmic domain and that it can actually go and, and bind RNA Otherwise, we would not find it in, in our data set. And when we went on to predict uh, where about it could bind RNA, we found like three peaks that they are likely to bind RNA, and they all fall within the, uh, the C end. So this suggests that we have to maybe revisit our model. So uh, upon ethylene perception, this C end can do what I said, the cleave and shadow model or the translational model, but we have found that there may be a longer isoform that actually we didn't know yet what it, what it does. So with that, I just want to conclude with like some take-home messages, just three of them. If you fell asleep during presentation, don't worry, just, just you know, remember the three points. The first one is that plant RNA interton capture or PTRIC, it allows isolation of active RBPs from multiple plant species. And here I just want to say that it's important that they are actively bound to the RNA and that they are from plant leaves. Then the second point is that the RNA binding protein is remodeled during plant immunity. At early time points, it looks like um, the actual RBPs that are there, they get activated or repressed possibly by PTMs and that at late time points, um, protein abundance is kind of driving a bit more um, this remodeling. And then the last bit is that we found that a number of these plant 22 responsive RBPs are actually relevant. And that when we mutate them, this yields a phenotype um, in plant immunity. And then I just want to end up by thanking uh, Gail Preston and Alfredo Castello for all their support, their amazing ideas, and then all the lab, which is a lot of people and former lab members as well, for all their input and great support, and then you for your attention. And I'm very happy to take any, any questions. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Marcel. That's really interesting. It's great to see IN2 popping up again. One of the one of the classic Arabidopsis mutants come back for another for another go yeah. around, I guess, from the interesting stuff you found. So I encourage everyone to ask uh, questions uh, in the question box if you have anything for Marcel about either about the technique or about the um, immunity aspects. So uh, we have a question from uh, Patricia Baldrick, uh, mm -hmm. and she actually asks about IN2. Um, mm -hmm. She asks, so she says that in other plant species, IN2 is regulated by microRNAs. Mm -hmm. And you, from your data set, do you have any evidence that IN2 is also regulated, like, 
also regulated by microRNAs? And yeah. you know, what can you say about that sort of regulation? Yeah. No, from my data set, I don't have any evidence, but I, I could, I wouldn't know anyway, because uh, my data set is just, I'm finding I'm too bound to pollinated RNAs and that's it. I cannot get any idea of if the transcript of I2 is being regulated by microRNAs. That would be, I'm aware of what she's saying. And um, that would be actually very cool to to check if, or to predict if it's targeted by microRNAs. But at this point, um, we haven't checked and I don't know um, if anyone has done it. Okay, cool. Um, so I wanted to ask a little bit. So you said you isolated uh, 21, you looked at 21 different mutant lines um, yeah. from, from the RNA binding proteins that you, you identified. So are there any incredible surprises in there that you want to share that you didn't share in your in your talk? I mean, uh, there were quite a number of them, um, but uh, not not really. So um, there are a number of, of them. So we selected some of them that were established RNA binding proteins, so known RNA binding proteins, some of them that were like novel RNA binding proteins, some um, feature proteins as well, because uh, I was interested in them uh, at a point when I selected the candidates. I just want that if people are working on RNA binding proteins or are interested in some of these proteins, that they go and check actually the bioarchive uh, paper. Uh, we have a nice table there where like we describe the protein, the salt, because in this case we use tDNA interaction on mutants, so we describe the salt, salt lines and the phenotype and everything. So if it's a quite a long list, so if people want to go there, they can actually uh, go and check all the data is, is on, on by archive. So I, I wanted to say also that this is a, I just gave you some flavor of what we found up and down regulated, right? But it's 330 proteins, so it's quite difficult to condense all the information here. But there's a lot of cool candidates things and, and a lot of novel things there. And I think that if you are interested in RBPs and plant immunity, just go there, mind this data set, it's there for everyone. All the RBPs that we found are there and all the ones that are regulated are there and we have a lot of information for, for everyone. If you have any feedback, just let us know if you want to collaborate as well. Just go use it. It's out there for everyone to use it. Um, and yeah, so enjoy it. I, I will say this is an absolute credit to to Marcel and, and his collaborators, his, his colleagues, that you know all their information is out there. So this is true also of the, the technique for the RNA interactome capture. All the techniques are there, you can download it and you can really have a look at the information. It's, it's been really published in a nice detailed way. So if you want to do these experiments as well. So I, I have a question, we have a question from Bryony Jacobs who asks yeah. about the RNA helicase that you, um, you mentioned. So she asks, yeah. so how does the RNA helicase identified affect the ROS burst? Do you have you any idea about the mechanism of that? I don't know yet. So uh, something uh, we are currently doing and we want to keep on doing is actually to know the RNAs that are bound to this protein, right? So we have looked at the protein sites, so proteins that bind more or less RNAs, but we don't know what they do because we don't know which RNAs are bound by them or are being regulated by them. So at this point, we have no clue um, about which target RNAs uh, this helicase is, is you know, unwinding or, or working with or binding. So that's the second part of it that, that is very cool and that we're trying to do at the moment, which is actually identify which RNAs are being regulated by them to kind of get into the details of the interactions and how then this translates into immunity. Because indeed, we don't know how this increase in uh, binding of with RNA of the RNA helicase translates into more um, ROS burst. On this case, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this data set really will open many doors to lots of different investigations. So I hope yeah. that there can be found some funding so you can continue with this, that, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay, so so I think we'll leave it there, Marcel, and we, we'll move on. Okay. Uh, but 